Hi guys, I'm glad you're here. Thank you very much for joining me. I wanted to cover um, the earthquakes that happen along the Mendocino Triple Junction. Doing some research yesterday after that magnitude 3.4 earthquake, I, I found out some interesting news. Oh, I'm Mary with Mary Greeley News, and thank you once again for joining me today. It is Wednesday, September 27, 2023. I bet you didn't know that 25% of California's earthquakes are actually up in the northern area of the Mendocino Triple Junction. Yeah, a lot of large earthquakes. There was a magnitude 7.2 in 2005, 2016 a 6.6, .6. uh, 1923 a 7.1. Yeah, that caused a tsunami. There was a series of earthquakes, large earthquakes in 1992. These two, 1992, the 6.5 and the 6.6, .6, were aftershocks from the 7.2 earthquake that was inland, and it also caused a tsunami. In 1980, there was an earthquake that caused a overpass to collapse, and um, several people, I believe six people, were injured. And then more shocking, did you guys know that there was an old nuclear power plant that was shut down, I believe, in 1976 that still has spent fuel rods stored there. Supposedly, it was built before they realized the seismic threat, and they kept upgrading and upgrading, and eventually it just got too um, expensive to continue the upgrades, so it was shut down. Um, it is a water boiler type of nuclear power plant, between 2010 and about 2018, the, fa the facility was decontaminated and dismantled after some 20 years in SAF-STOR. What that abbreviation means is long-term storage condition for a permanent shutdown nuclear power plant. Uh, during that shutdown, radioactive Contamination decreases substantially, making subsequent decontamination and demolition easier and reducing the amount of LLW required disposal. LLW is low waste disposal. Another thing that is very concerning, back in 2004, PG&E announced that three nuclear fuel rods were unaccounted for. Uh, they said there was conflicting records about where they were at. The fuel rods were never found. But they said they believed at the time they were still on site in the spent fuel storage pool. So what happened to all the spent fuel? Well, evidently, as of 2009, I haven't found anything that was updated, uh, they were buried in the ground, three feet below grade, I, I imagine that's ground level, and are currently um, stored at 44 feet above sea level with heavy, with very heavy lids. The containers are filled with helium and inert gas and will remain on site, on site as long as Congress and the Department of Energy does not comply with its agreement under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. Um... So they were buried in dry casks and are supposedly safe for at least 60 years beyond licensing agreement. So supposedly those uh, spent fuel rods, the containers that they are in, are good for another probably 50 years. Somewhere 44 feet above sea level, which brings me to a concern of tsunamis. There's been past tsunamis, earthquakes with tsunamis in this area. Like I said, uh, this area has 25% of all the uh, earthquakes that California has. And since 1933, there has been 32 tsunamis that have been observed at Crescent City, Humboldt County. Doing a Google search here, it says five of those caused damage and one of them in March of 1964 remains the largest and most destructive recorded tsunami ever to strike 
the United States Pacific Coast, according to the uh, University of Southern California Tsunami Research Center. That tsunami was caused by the uh, 9.2 earthquake that occurred in Alaska when it reached uh, Crescent City. Uh, one of the bigger waves was at 21 feet. 11 people there in Crescent City were killed, and 29 city blocks were destroyed. I don't know how large the 1700 Cascadia Subduction Zone earthquake was uh, for the tsunami when it hit that area, but this one here, um, over 289 buildings were destroyed. Many were pushed off their foundation. And, of course, millions of dollars in damage. There was also an earthquake there along the Cruel Islands, a magnitude 8.3, um, that caused $5.9 million in damage to the small boat basin there in Crescent Harbor. I'll give you a link to this paper. It's about the Cascadia subduction zone, and it starts out with ruptures on just different sections, not the rupture for the entire length and it talks about a rupture for the Gorda segment which is this area that covers Ferndale, Eureka, all that. Let me bring this out. This here is the Gorda section of the Cascadia subduction zone. So they did this study where this just this section of the Cascadia subduction zone ruptured and they figured there would be a tsunami of possibly 39 feet yeah um, which would bring it up to where those spent fuel rods are sitting at so here is a map of the tsunami they got narrow wide um different tsunami yeah and there let me try and pull this over so you can see yeah the area that they would considered inundated from a tsunami. It's not a very good map. Here it says we performed inundation models for tsunamis affecting uh, Crescent City using both near and far field sources. Our models accurately simulated the water level history produced by the March uh, 28, 1964 earthquake, the 1992 um, Cape Mendocino earthquake, and the November 15th, 2006, Kroll um, Islands earthquake. These are all earthquakes that created tsunamis. Our results suggested that the tsunami caused by ruptures on the Cascadia subduction zone would impact Crescent City worse than in 1964. Uh, such an event would inundate 3.8 kilometers inland. So that would be about 2.8 three six miles inland we noted that the maximum slip rate in any of our scenarios for the gorda rupture is eight meters so that would be a little more than 26 feet if the slip were substantially greater both wave heights and inundation event would be larger the arrival of the first tsunami wave at crescent city for all gorda ruptures is only minutes after the earthquake is initiated. The crest of the first tsunami wave arrives at the tidal gauge in Crescent City in only 25 minutes. Because of the north coast of California is so close to the leading edge of the subduction zone, the adjacent offshore area is predominantly uplifted in a cascading event producing a lead elevated wave. So going back to Google Earth, here we have Crescent City. Okay. This would all be inundated about, um, what, almost two and a half miles. Let's get the little measure thing out. And, um, somewhere in there. Let me zoom in. Anyway, you know, from that direction on the coastline. Let's do it down here. Yeah, it, it would be devastating. And then we'll come back out and I'll show you where that nuclear power plant is at. So here we have Crescent City and I'll measure to the, or try to measure to the nuclear power plant. How many miles that is, if I can get this thing to work. 
There we go. Okay, it's about 71 miles. So if you got spent fuel rods that are unearthed because they're only three feet below the ground from a tsunami. And this nuclear power plant is off this bay. Um, only about two miles from this one shoal, I guess you would call it. Um, South Port Landing, South Bay. Did any of you know that there was an old nuclear power plant here? I certainly didn't. Now here under Google it says dry casks are licensed or certified for up to 40 years. So I don't know why those there, maybe because they have helium in them, are licensed for 60 years. How long would the material in dry storage be radioactive? And it says the nuclear material will be radioactive for more than 100,000 years. Um, I think there'll be another major Cascadia subduction earthquake within that time. Don't you think so? It says this radioactive waste is stirred outside in above ground concrete and steel containers, dry cast. Well, this one is, is buried only three feet under the ground and 44 feet above sea level. Why did they allow it to remain there? Do any of you know? So because of just the history of past earthquakes, like I said, 25% of the earthquakes, um, yeah, is in this area. And with the past history of tsunamis, one, you know, the one they had last year, the 6.4. Look at all the damage that that one caused. Um, I, I'm, it's a beautiful area. I got to admit, it's a beautiful area. Um, people probably have lived there for generations in some locations. But I got them all marked in red that I could go find. Going back to, um, uh, let's see. Oh, we got 2016, 19, probably 1980. Oh, we got 1932. I mean, there is a lot of earthquakes, large earthquakes. Okay. So it's just a matter of time for another one. Yeah, I don't know. What do you do? Stay or move? Take the chance. Russian roulette. Yeah, hope for the best. Uh, let's see, 1980. There was an image that I found for um, that overpass that collapsed. I'll give you a link to this also. Yeah, six people were injured, I believe. Uh, two cars, maybe more, but I think it was two cars uh, were on the bridge when it collapsed. And that was the uh, 7.2 earthquake. They also have a map of more um, areas that are susceptible to tsunamis. We got uh, Moonstone, McKinleyville, Arcadia. Um, yeah, Arcadia Bay, um, Eureka. Let's see, South Bay, Shelter Cove, Eel River. Yeah, that's all they got here. These areas, too, as you know, are susceptible to lots of landslides. Yeah, I found that out when I was doing the research for that 3.4 that happened yesterday. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, put your comments down below. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please share my videos. That will help with um, the placing of my videos here on YouTube. Make sure you're still subscribed. And I'll talk to you later. God bless you. Bye.